It was the 31st of December when the world first heard of an unknown virus that was causing pneumonia in Wuhan, China. That led to reports of increasing death and illness in China that soon was spread to the rest of the world. By January 21st, Washington State was reporting the first victim of what was now commonly referred to as the coronavirus. The virus then continued to spread not only across America, but around the globe as the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control scrambled to gain knowledge and provide guidance on how the world should respond. By March 11th, the World Health Organization had declared COVID-19 a pandemic. Two days later, President Trump declared a national emergency and before we knew it, schools were closed sports were canceled, and business was grinding to a halt. We were told to wash our hands and cover our coughs, then to practice social distancing, and finally to avoid contact at all. We were left with our heads spinning. Have we entered into some kind of twilight zone? Our lives have changed drastically in such a short time. We try to make sense out of the daily barrage of statistics and data, out of messages from our politicians and directives that they give, and out of all the stories of personal cases and stories of healthcare workers on the front line. Chisaw in northern Washington is a blessed place to be right now. But we are still grappling with the rest of the world, trying to understand this global happening. So as believers in Christ, we are turning in prayer, and we are turning to God's word to implore our Heavenly Father regarding how we should react and how we shouldn't react. Father, what's happening on earth? What does this mean for your earth? What does it mean for America? What does this mean for me, Lord? How do I respond? And as we ponder that, we realize that we should turn to the Word of God. How does the Word guide us, Lord? When things seem to be going awry on this earth, as believers, we often wonder, is this the end times? Is this the Great Tribulation? Have we entered into those years, Lord? Perhaps you've read, like I have, predictions that this pandemic is the fourth horseman from Revelation, the pale colored horse with a green hue that brings pestilence and death. Let's go to the word and see if that pans out. Because if it does, it would truly mean that tri the tribulation years have arrived. In case you're not familiar with the four horsemen mentioned in Revelation, let's review that scripture and hopefully get some clarity. The reference is found in Revelation 6. This is the beginning of the opening of the scroll and the seven seals by none other than the Lamb of God, by none other than Jesus, the only one who could be found worthy to do this. I'll read from chapter 6 of Revelation, verses 1 through 8, where we see the opening of the first four seals of the scroll, which bring the four horsemen. 
also Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come! I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard a second living creature say, Come! Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hands. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades following close behind him. There were, they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. These four horsemen appear to represent four disastrous occurrences that will take place on earth at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. Now before we go into this briefly, I need to say, as I often do, <laughs> there are opinions all over the place about who these horsemen are. As you know, I never claim to be a Bible scholar, but what Mike and I attempt to do is to do some research and to pray and then to present what, God, what we believe God is telling us to present to you. So here is an afternoon's worth of reading what other Bible scholars have to say and hopefully narrowing it down to something simple that we can grasp. Briefly, the white horseman comes first. The rider wears a crown and holds a bow. Some have attributed this rider to be Jesus, largely because Jesus appears on a white horse in chapter 19. But upon a closer look, the rider is bent on conquest. He has a bow, but there is no mention of arrows. So does he come to bring persuasion, to influence the world? Does he come to mimic Jesus, to gain power over the world? In other words, is he the Antichrist? That seems to be the accepted conclusion. At first, he seems like a good guy. He brings a time of false peace to the world. But then he begins to show his true colors. He is bent on conquering the world. And he will wage war upon the saints. The second horse is a fiery red horse, and he comes to take peace from the earth. He carries a large sword and obviously represents war and violence. 
He follows the white horse because driving for conquest eventually leads to war. The Antichrist will wage physical war as well as spiritual war. This horseman carries a large sword. So this war and violence will be on a very large scale and it will take many lives. Following on the heels of the red horse and following a natural progression comes the black horse. The rider carries a pair of scales in his hands indicating an economic collapse, an injustice, out of balance, where common grains of wheat and barley cost a day's wage, but more opulent things like wine and oil are preserved. There is famine in the land and entire civilizations collapse with economic destruction. The last horse, the one many are saying has arrived or is arriving, is the pale horse with a green hue. His rider is death and Hades follows close behind him. They are given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. The earth is full of war and violence. Conquest is unfolding. The systems of civilization are destroyed and there is anarchy. Death is prevailing over a quarter of the earth's population. Now, having reviewed all of that, let us take a serious look at the world today. Would you agree that there are wars and rumors of wars? Would you agree that there have been earthquakes in diverse places? Yes, we would all agree. What would Jesus say regarding this? Let's read in Matthew chapter 24, starting at verse 3. Matthew 24, chapter 3, Ma chapter 24, verse 3. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Such things must happen but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pangs. All these are the beginning of birth pangs. Are we at the beginning of labor. We're noticing these happenings in the world. They are concerning. They're, they keep coming and they seem to be growing in intensity and frequency. The beginning of labor. As labor progresses and the horsemen truly come, it will be a time of unprecedented distress. On down in, in chapter 24 of Matthew, verse 23 says, For then there will be great distress, unequaled 
from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. We feel distressed and this pandemic is certainly unprecedented for our day but it is not unprecedented in the history of the world. We can look back to the bubonic plague and the great famine that occurred between 1315 and 1317, where 75 to 200 million, not thousand, but million people died. It caused a great social and economic upheaval, and it had profound effects on the course of history in Europe. We can look more recently at the Spanish flu of 1918, where 500 million people were infected, and the death toll was estimated between 17 and 50 million. What do we see with our current pandemic? As of yesterday, there was just over 1 million cases with close to 63,000 deaths globally. So while this may be unprecedented in our time, it doesn't even come close to other pandemics of recent history. So, what am I saying? I'm saying that we are in hard times. And we may very well be in the beginning of labor. But this is not unprecedented. This is not unequaled. I'm certainly not hard-hearted as far as the thousands of deaths or how ill people are getting with this virus. There is much distress in the world today. Here is what we would like to say to the church, to this little gathering of the body of Christ here in Chisaw, Washington. This doesn't appear to be the tribulation according to the word of God. But it is most certainly a foreshadowing. It is most certainly a foretaste of the distress that is to come. So what are we to do? First, as Christians, we need to comply with the leaders of our country. We are rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but then we must render unto God what is God's. How are we to be obedient? On down in the 24th chapter of Matthew, Jesus commands us, urges us, Keep watch, be alert, align your life with Jesus, focus on Jesus in these times, understand full well how to do that because you're going to need to be able to do it our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears must be open and we must be walking in a spiritual path. Did you know that the Bible has many stories of plagues? We would say pandemic today. Many stories of plagues that were brought against the land and many people perished. Did you also know that in all of those plagues in the Word of God, there is no mention of this coming from the hand of the enemy, from Satan, but rather they come from the hand of God. 
Why? Why does God cause a plague, a pandemic, to come over the land? Exclusively, exclusively, it was because of disobedience to God's word and ignoring of God. God was no longer important. God carried no place in the lives of the people. In America today, God has become a figment of the imagination of some simple-minded people called Christians. Those religious right fanatics. So laws have been passed in our land that directly oppose the law of God. Unborn babies are killed by the thousands every year. We have perverted your institution of marriage, Lord. We are given over to materialism and notoriety. Church, we need to be on our knees before a great and mighty God, remembering that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. He is bringing America, if not the world, to its knees, incapacitating us, bringing upheaval to the world in a matter of weeks. Let us do as Daniel did and fall on our faces before God and repent. Daniel repented for Israel. He didn't cause the turning away. He had little to do with them not listening to the prophets and turning away from God. In fact, in Babylon, where they were held in captivity, he was honored in Nebuchadnezzar's court. He was living the good life with opulent food and wine. But his inner man grieved for Israel. He fasted and prayed in earnest for God to forgive his people and return them from their captivity. We should not be sensationalizing this pandemic as part of the great tribulation, but rather we should be on our knees and repenting for our country. Let us stand in the gap and beseech God. Let us cry out to God. Let us call out to heaven. Forgive us, Father. We have grievously sinned against you. Lord, we know this is a foreshadowing, a foretaste of your great power that is to come upon the earth. Prepare us, make us ready, give us courage, Lord, cause us to be spiritually alert and watching for the buds on the trees, the changing of the season that will lead to the end times. But Lord, in the meantime, we fall on our knees and repent for America. Let us read Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 7, 13 and 14. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among the people, if my people who are called by my name 
will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Let us pray. Father, we beseech you, Lord. We cry out to you, Father. Our country has so sinned against you. Father, as your church, we stand in the gap, Lord, as Daniel did. Lord, we repent. We have sinned against you. We ask for your forgiveness. We plead for your mercy, Lord, for your everlasting kindness, for your long-suffering heart. Father, we are sorry. Bring us together as a church, Lord. Cause us to fall on our knees individually and yet collectively. We ask you to save America. We ask you to save our families. We ask you, Lord, to heal our, our land. We pray all this in your son's precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen.